Alexis de Tocqueville, as we have noted, appears to have had some appeal to both ends of the political spectrum left and right. Or rather, both have found him to be useful for their purposes in certain circumstances. His rational acceptance of the new forces of democracy brought about by the American and French revolutions made him an icon of left-wing liberals. However, during the Cold War, that is, from the end of World War II until the collapse of communism that was adopted by some leading thinkers on the right. So, there are two sides to his political philosophy, and the man himself that we need to look at. Now, I would suggest that de Tocqueville's biography is important here. You must always bear in mind when reading him that he was an aristocrat, and one whose family had suffered in the French Revolution. He wasn't your typical aristocrat because his politics differed from others of his family and social rank. He abandoned the Catholic Church and married beneath his class. Yet he never quite threw off the prejudices of that class. However, and what is important, he did recognize and believe that the tendency of history, which in those days could be traced back to the Middle Ages, was towards the leveling of social ranks, and more equal and democratic conditions. The French Revolution had in the end brought Napoleon, whom he hated, but democracy would inevitably come to France. His trip to America was to see democracy in practice, make note of its shortcomings and errors, and then find safeguards against them. In today's lecture I'm going to talk about changes in air pollution since the middle of the last century and what has created these changes. So, um, by the 1950s, air pollution was very visible with frequent thick black fogs known as smogs in many large cities around the world. The main source of this pollution was from factories and it caused severe health problems. For example, a particularly severe smog in London in 1952 caused over 4,000 deaths. Obviously something had to be done and in 1956 a Clean Air Act was introduced in Britain. 
This addressed the pollution from factories and the smog soon disappeared. However, as you know, these days air pollution is still a big issue. The main difference between now and the 1950s is that you can't see it, it's invisible. Also, the main source of pollution now is from cars and lorries, and although these don't produce visible signs, this air pollution is still a significant risk to health. And one of the key factors in the rise of this type of pollution is that we have all become much more vehicle dependent. There are far more cars and lorries, trains, and planes than in the 1950s and this is now the main source of air pollution around the world. So there are two theories for how the gas giants formed. One is the same theory I showed you just now core accretion, right. And the other is called disk instability and one of our colleagues at DTM has done a lot of work on that and so it's unclear exactly how they formed but you're right what we're trying to do the reason we're trying to get the higher and higher pressure in the lab is because we are trying to understand more about the pressure inside the gas giants. It's thought that the gas giants also have a metallic core, but maybe the metallic core not made of iron. Hydrogen, for example becomes metallic at a certain pressure. So it's very possible that the insides of these planets could have metallic cores, could have hydrogen cores, could have rocky portions we're not sure but the higher pressure we can get in the lab the closer we can get understanding the interiors of the gas giants and the exoplanet that are so big
Hello everyone. Today's lecture is about setting up a website. I'm going to be focusing on things that you need to consider to ensure your website really adds value to the people using it. So there are three main areas you need to think about. The first and most important thing is who is your target audience. When you're creating a new website you really need to think about who the users are and what information they'll be looking for. What we do when we set up websites is to group users based on their needs. So, for a website in the academic community, for example, we may have groups such as researchers and administrators, and this helps us design the site and add information that is relevant to each group. The second point is accessibility. The main thing here is to ensure your website can be found. And you can do this by making sure it can be reached from areas on the web where your target audience are also active. So this may mean providing links on other websites or maybe using social media. And thirdly retention making sure your target audience return to your website regularly. You do this by ensuring it gives them a reason to come back. So it's important to keep the site up to date and make sure it provides the latest news and interesting information and so on. Supersymmetry is a mathematical idea that people have developed an effort to understand the sharpest organizing principle for the fundamental constituents of matter. You see, we have learned that particles that seem to be different, can actually secretly be united by certain symmetry principles. So we use the fact that there are symmetric objects in the world like a sphere or basketball. You turn a sphere, and even though you've transformed it, it looks the same fundamentally. We found that certain particles when you transform one particle into another, even though looks like the identity of the particle has changed, Overall the equations describing it they don't change at all at an underlying level of symmetry, but we've not been able to do is find a symmetry that would relate certain kinds of particles, namely matter particles and force particles. Matter particles are particles like electron, muons, and quarks, 
Force particles are like photons and gluons and WZ bosons. Supersymmetry is a symmetry that actually relates to these two kinds, these two classes of particles. And people have proven that supersymmetry is the last possible symmetry of the fundamental particles that are mathematics, reality has not yet been shown to make use of it. So people are now trying to see whether that symmetry might actually be working in the world can be found evidence for it in our understanding of fundamental particles. From reading philosophy, I came up with three principles as the guiding principles for a just city, of the principles of equity, democracy, and diversity. Of these were derived from the works of a number of philosophers, most preeminently I supposed on Ross. My choice of word equity rather than equality is in fact based on Ross's argument that a policy ought to distribute benefits to people where the worst off become better off. So the worst off don't have to become equal to everybody else but no policy should in fact make those who are most disadvantaged more disadvantaged. And it means that we have to talk about the policy at the time it's being enacted. To say, while we have to make our city more competitive because sometime and by and by, the benefits will trickle down to those people who were worst off doesn't justify making them worst off as that time. We have a lot of examples on the world of people whose homes were destroyed in the name of the greater good and say eventually they will benefit. But equity means that you do not in fact take advantage of those people who are weakest.
conduct disorder in children is very serious. It's a disorder of childhood and adolescence that is long-term, that's chronic, where children have very aggressive impulses, where children are involved in difficulties with the law and really seem to have no regard for the rules or for authority. When children have conduct disorder they are definitely at risk of carrying these difficulties into adulthood which also brings about a myriad of different problems. Children with conduct disorder often have difficulties in schools, have difficulty with relationships and have difficulty with employment and lifelong long-term relationships. It's important to recognize that if your child is not doing well in school, if your child has had difficulty where legal action was necessary, if your child is bullying, getting into fights and this is constant and ongoing, if your child does not get help these complexities will really exacerbate into other major difficulties. Look for signs of your child's grades dropping, look for signs of repeated detentions, suspensions, and brushes with the law. Parents please recognize that if your child has signs of conduct disorder the sooner you get help, the sooner your child can start to learn more adaptive behaviors. I suppose that it has always been the case for the majority of us that the first test of a work of art or literature or music is how much pleasure it gives us, and we don't want to bother with analyzing why or how it has had such an emotional impact on us. It's always good to know what your pleasures are in the positive sense, and not as easy as some people think, as opposed to only really knowing what you don't like and complaining about it, though presumably there's some kind of pleasure to be had from that too. But now that you've chosen to take a course on the novel, I'm afraid that evaluating literature on the basis of how you feel about a book won't count as an intelligent critical response to the work being studied. It is, however, useful to remind yourselves from time to time that we all fall for trash every now and again. For instance, you might actually enjoy listening to a catchy pop song, but you'd find it hard to explain in critical terms that it is good, or better than something else, just because it is enjoyable. 
So, you're here to sharpen up your critical knives, as it were, among other things of course. Interviewer, in an article that you wrote that I just read, you said you wished you could take everyone back to decades ago to look at the Florida Keys. Interviewee, 50 years ago. Think about how much change has taken place in that short period of time. We have managed to consume on the order of 90% of the big fish in the ocean, the tunas, the swordfish, the sharks. They're mostly gone. Until recently people have had the belief that there isn't much we puny human beings can do to change the nature of the ocean. But in fact, we have not just because of what we've been taking out, and the destructive means often applied to take fish and other creatures from the sea, but also what we're putting into the sea, either directly or what we put into the atmosphere that falls back into the sea. Interviewer, so if you were going to give a grade on the health of the oceans today, what would it be? Interviewee, well, it depends on which aspect. Across the board. Huh. The oceans are in trouble. It's hard for me to assign a specific grade. Maybe C.
This week I'd like to start by talking a bit about electric vehicles. Although we tend to think of electric cars as being something completely modern, they were in fact some of the earliest types of motorized vehicle. At the beginning of the 20th century electric cars were actually more popular than cars with an internal combustion engine as they were more comfortable to ride in. However, as cars fueled by petrol increased in importance, electric cars declined. The situation became such that electric vehicles were only used for certain specific purposes, as forklift trucks, ambulances, and urban delivery vehicles, for example. Although electricity declined in use in road vehicles, it steadily grew in importance as a means of powering trains. Switzerland for example, was quick to develop an electrified train system, encouraged in this no doubt by the fact that it had no coal or oil resources of its own. Nowadays there is renewed interest in electricity as a means of powering road vehicles. Why is this the case? Well, Undoubtedly economic reasons are of considerable importance. The cost of oil has risen so sharply that there is a strong financial imperative to look for an alternative. However, there are also environmental motivations. Emissions from cars are blamed in large part for among other things the destruction of the ozone layer and the resultant rise in temperatures in the polar regions. A desire not to let things get any worse is also encouraging research into designing effective electric transport. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture and, in particular, to the work of Frank O'Gary. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often their buildings would have this basic shape and they would just earn, add bits of decoration like splashes of color or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and grid-like designs. 
He wanted the freedom.to experiment with other shapes curves and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualize and experiment with complex shapes, and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture as art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, um, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. A dimension of space is basically an independent direction in which in principle you could move, you could walk, so we talk about left and right, you can freely move left right, back forth, you can move back forth, up down, you can freely move up down as well. If you consider a diagonal direction, that's not a new direction because that's just a combination of moving this way and that way. So when we talk about dimensions, we talk about the independent directions, which you can move. Another way to think about dimensions, they are the data that needs to be specified in order to delineate where something takes place. So if you're having a dinner party, you give your friend a straight, a cross straight in the floor number, three pieces of information to nail down a location in three dimensions in the space. According to the string theory, in reality you need to give your friend more than just those three pieces of information if you really want him or her to know where to go. You need to tell them coordinates, data, that specifies real actual dimensions the dinner parties taking place, too, but because the actual dimensions we think are so small, it does not matter to your friend whether they show up exactly at the right location and actual dimensions or not because things are not able to penetrate them in any meaningful way. But that's what dimension would be, it's a piece of data necessary to delineate where something takes place.
there are four fundamental forces at work in the universe. Some of them are very familiar from everyday life, some of them are not, so we all know about gravity, that's one of the four forces, it's what keeps us ankles to the surface of the earth, keeps the earth in orbit around a Sunday. There is another force that we're very familiar with, which is the electromagnetic force, that is the force that is responsible for the electricity, electric currents for light, for the sun's light, that's electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun to the earth. There are two other forces though, that are somewhat less familiar, they are the nuclear forces. They are forces that are at work within the nuclear atoms. One of those forces is called the strong nuclear force, that really is the force that bides protons to proton, bides the quarks inside of the protons and neutrons keeping them from flying out. The other nuclear force is called the weak nuclear force. And that's a force that predominantly we know of because it's responsible for radioactivity, radioactive decay. So those four forces, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and gravitational force, those are the forces that work in the universe. One other keys to Apple is Apple's incredibly collaborative company, and so you know how many committees we have in Apple? Zero. No committee. We are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software, one person is in charge of Mac hardware. One person is in charge of iPhone hardware engineering, another person is in charge of worldwide marketing, another person's in charge of operations. We're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet and we all meet for three hours once a week and we talk about everything we're doing the whole business and there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. 
and teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time but trusting that they're gonna come through with their parts and that's what we do really well and we're great at figuring out how to divide things up in these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing touch basis frequently and bring it all together into a product we do that really well and so what i do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products to make new marketing programs whatever it is Across the world people have been watching the choice that Britain has made. I would reassure those markets and investors that Britain's economy is fundamentally strong and I would also reassure Britons living in European countries and European citizens living here that there will be no immediate changes in your circumstances. There will be no initial change in the way our people can travel, in the way our goods can move or the way our services can be sold. We must now prepare for a negotiation with the European Union. This will need to involve the full engagement of the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland governments to ensure that the interests of all parts of our United Kingdom are protected and advanced. But above all this will require strong, determined, and committed leadership. I'm very proud and very honoured to have been Prime Minister of this country for six years. I believe we've made great steps, with more people in work than ever before in our history, with reforms to welfare and education, increasing people's life chances, building a bigger and stronger society, keeping our promises to the poorest people in the world and enabling those who love each other to get married whatever their sexuality, but above all restoring Britain's economic strength.
Okay to help you with your research, I just wanted to give you some tips today on using focus groups. These are groups of people that you get together to find out about their opinions and attitudes, for example, to review a piece of work or just basically provide some collective input to help you with whatever you're researching. First of all, how large should a focus group be? Well, I would say that an ideal number of participants is around six or seven. If it's any bigger, what quite often happens is they break into side conversations and the focus is lost. If it's any smaller, you may not get the range of views that you need to get a really good discussion. Secondly, it's important that you have a moderator for the group, who's able to facilitate and guide the discussions. The moderator must ensure that everyone participates and stop anyone dominating. And also, the moderator needs to make sure that the discussions don't go off in the wrong direction. And thirdly, in order to help the group focus on what's required, some basic materials should be used particularly to kickstart the discussions. This may be in the form of pictures, photos, diagrams, graphs, etc. and will help the group to understand the context of what needs to be discussed. We actually have seen more than one of these black holes emerges and we've seen actually two about equally good although the one that we talked about you can see with your eyes. The second one is the one with the lighter black holes in it, they're not so heavy, when the ringing is a lot longer and you can see it without all the fancy data analysis. Then there is a third source which we've already published, but now that we have seen that two of the other one and we also believe that could very well be black hole theory, so we have three sources, let's call it three sources in three months. Now if we make design sensitivity, we have improved apparatus, by another factor of three. Now how does that translate into rate? It turns out if you look with a sensitivity three times better than we have, you can look three times deeper into the universe. 
That says the volume of the universe that you are looking at is 3 to the Q, so that's about 27 or 30 around the universe. So instead seeing one a month of these black hole periods, we should see one of maybe one of every two days, one every day. That's gonna change the character of how we operate completely. At that moment launched into what I call the astronomy that's associated gravitational wave astronomy. That's gonna be a big day. The internet is changing everything. The world of language in the future is totally different from the world of language in the past and the reason is quite simple. There is more written language on the internet now than all the libraries in the world combined. We've never seen anything like it before and we haven't seen anything yet. When you're talking about the future of a language, we are asking about its long-term prospects, where do they essentially lie? And my answer is they lie in the young people, they lie especially in the hands of teenagers. The teenagers are the parents of next generation of children. If teenagers are going to succeed in maintaining the intergenerational transmission of a language, then they have got to be infused about the minority language, the endangered language that their parents and others speak, so how would you get teenagers infused is the question. Well there is no question today. The only thing that infuses teenagers, apart from sex, is internet, and all the electronic world. And so that is the area where one has got to focus. A minority language has got to get itself up electronically in all the varieties that are available to it. Now in the case of something like Welsh, there is already quite a strong Welsh presence on the World Wide Web and increasingly there are Welsh chat rooms, Welsh blogs, Welsh Facebook interactions and so on. Well this is a very very positive sign, and it needs to be reinforced as much as possible. The future of the Welsh language I think all languages actually lies in the electronic domain.
What I want to look at today is the question of how much technology, if, um, a pen can indeed be called technology, perhaps I should say the instrument of writing, affects a writer's style and level of production. I also want to consider other factors that may have an effect on prose style, such as personality, educational background, and so on. Now, production levels aren't so hard to measure in relation to the writing instrument used. The quill pen, for instance, would need continual refilling and resharpening, which led to a leisurely, balanced style of prose full of simple sentences. Writing took a lot longer than now and the great novelists of the 18th century, Fielding, Smollett, Richardson, had a relatively small output, though some of their books ran to enormous length. By the middle of the 19th century, the fountain pen had been invented. It didn't need such constant refilling, which can account for the more flowing, discursive style of, say, Dickens and Thackeray, as well as their tremendous output. Then came the typewriter, whose purpose, once you got the hang of it, was to speed up the writing process and was therefore much favored by journalists. This, it seems to me, gave rise to a short-winded style characterized by short sentences. A short prose style, if you like. Dictating machines and tape recorders led, as one novelist complained, to writers becoming too conversational, rambling and long-winded. Henry James, although he didn't use these machines, dictated his later novels and, well, some might agree with this accusation. Well, it looks as though we're going to have to leave word processors, computers and, of course, the way film and its narrative techniques have affected writing style for another day. Now as we all know, it has long been the habit in many countries that teachers give homework to school children of all ages. Despite the fact that a minority of educators don't agree with this practice, it has never seriously been questioned or challenged before. 
However, it may be that the tide is turning. These days, more people are becoming convinced that homework is of virtually no benefit, particularly for children in the younger age group. So, why have teachers always given homework? Well, the answer seems to be because they are obliged to. Most teachers don't really believe it has any real value. And the latest research supports the teachers' feelings about this. Not only does homework have very little impact on children's learning but it also puts unnecessary obligations and responsibilities onto the parents. These days not all families have the time or the necessary knowledge to help their offspring. So it would seem that now, senior educators want to start a new initiative. Rather than giving homework, they plan to encourage reading books of any kind, just reading. And they claim that this is a far more effective method of consolidating learning than wading through piles of written homework.